A deadly conflict in northern Ethiopia is raising concerns about an all-out civil war. Possible war crimes in Ethiopia after reports emerged of a massacre of civilians in the Tigray region. Well, the crisis has reached a very dangerous tipping point, threatening to destabilize the entire region, the Horn of Africa. Hello and welcome to The Nexus. Is your country led by a Nobel Peace Prize winner? Ethiopia is, and yet the nation is today anything but peaceful. Hundreds of people have reportedly been killed and tens of thousands are fleeing to neighboring Sudan, all since the beginning of this month. We'll have analysis from Addis Ababa and elsewhere in a moment. But first, a quick Ethiopia 101. Ethiopia is Africa's most populous nation, after Nigeria, with 110 million people. The so-called cradle of mankind, the place where humans got their start, or at least one of the places. On the map, it's equally impressive, more than four times bigger than the UK. It was bigger still until 1991, when Eritrea broke away, taking Ethiopia's coastline with it. Its other neighbors in the Horn of Africa include Sudan to the northwest, Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya, and South Sudan. Ethiopia itself comprises dozens of ethnic groups and their regions, the main ones being Amoria, Amhara, Somali, and Tigray, which is tucked away in the north with a population of five and a half million people. This is where the latest conflict has flared. There's a power struggle going on between this region and the federal government in Addis Ababa. The federal government is led by Africa's youngest leader, 44-year-old Abiy Ahmed, who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize just last year for reducing tensions with neighboring Eritrea. The government in Tigray is led by Debrecen Gebre Mikel of the Tigray People's Liberation Front, or TPLF. The power struggle began around the time Abiy became prime minister in 2018. But in the last couple of months, things have really escalated. In September, Tigray held a regional election, defying Prime Minister Abiy's order to postpone it due to COVID-19. Abiy deemed the vote illegal. On November the 4th, the war of words gave way to actual armed conflict. Tigrayan regional security forces took over a federal military base in Tigray's capital, Makale. And at the same time, it attacked a different unit in the town of Dansha. Abiy called that the final red line and declared a state of emergency in the region, sending in troops and ordering airstrikes. He also reportedly cut off electricity, telephone and internet services to the region. The TPLF says Tigray's forces have only ever acted in self-defense and that government forces are killing civilians and doing so with the help of neighboring Eritrea, which is why Tigrayan forces launched rockets at Eritrea's capital, Asmara, targeting the airport and Ministry of Information. It's hard to know who's telling the truth, but it's clear that people on both sides are being killed. The Ethiopian government claims that Tigrayan forces killed hundreds of federal troops in the November 4th attack in Dansha, and that they carried out a massacre of up to 500 civilians in a town called Maikadra five days later. That there was a massacre is not disputed but it's not yet clear who carried out the killings or who the victims were. Meanwhile, the United Nations reports that as many as 27,000 people have already left the region, most heading for Sudan. Now, the government is trying to convince the world its so-called law enforcement operation will soon be over, but the UN Secretary General is warning the conflict could actually destabilize the entire Horn of Africa. Well, that is a daunting prospect, and some are even warning that Ethiopia could collapse if this conflict is not resolved. Is that realistic? Let's bring in our guest now. And joining us from Addis Ababa, we have William Davison of the International Crisis Group, which tries to prevent conflict around the world. And we have the Ethiopian academic, Ewol Allo, who teaches at Keele University in Northeast England. William, I'd like to start with you. In every conflict, inevitably, people try to work out for themselves, don't they? Who is in the right and who is in the wrong? Now, I'm not going to put it to you in those terms, but perhaps you can just explain what's really behind this conflict. 
Well, what's happened here is that um, there was a major political transition, a change of power in Ethiopia in 2018. That was on the back of around three years of anti-government protests. Those anti-government protests, um, to a certain extent, were directed at what is known as the TPLF, the ruling party of Tigray region. Um, that was generally seen as the most powerful entity, uh, political entity in Ethiopia for the previous quarter of a century or so. After the protests uh, led to a change of power in 2018, the TPLF lost a lot of power at the federal level. Um, subsequent to that, there was a very bitter um, falling out between the new leaders of Ethiopia, including the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and the TPLF leadership. Um, the TPLF accused Abiy and his allies of scapegoating them for all of the country's problems, um, of unfairly prosecuting them. And then as this developed, uh, the TPLF also found it in opposition at the federal level when Prime Minister Abiy created a new national political party, Prosperity Party, to replace the former ruling coalition. So this was really the, the seeds in the last three years of this conflict. And it escalated um, into, this, into this dispute, um, which has now got to this uh, very serious stage last, uh, this year. Um, and that was because the government... Um, delayed elections due to the pandemic. Um, this led to all government terms being extended, in, in term, including Tigray government's terms. And the TPLF rejected this. They said it was unconstitutional. Uh, they went ahead and ran their own regional election in defiance of federal authority. The federal government said that the new elected Tigrayan government was illegitimate. The TPLF um, and Tigray's government, they said that the federal government had no legal authority in Tigray or elsewhere in Ethiopia as it had overstayed its constitutional mandate. This really set the parties on a collision course. The federal government wanted to run delayed elections by June next year, um, but there was no sign of the TPLF allowing the federal government to do so in Tigray. Um, this really upped the tensions between the two. Then there was sort of military uh, maneuverings um, and ultimately the outbreak of conflict um, and that seems to have been finally triggered um, by the TPLF and Tigray leadership in partnership with some Tigrayan officers in the federal military, um, uh, taking control of aspects of the federal military stationed in, mm. in Tigray. Um, and the federal government responded to this with a military intervention um, to try and remove mm. that TPLF leadership. So clearly both sides yeah. do not trust each other. The Tigray regional government thinks it's in the right because it's upholding democracy and secretly believes that the Ethiopian federal government is afraid to face the electorate and, to, and, to, and, to, and afraid that Abiy won't be elected. And the federal government believes it's holding the country together and holding the constitution together. Um, in any conflict like this, people would expect the federal forces to easily defeat regional forces, but that's not necessarily the case here. Can you just describe the, the relative strength of these two forces? It's going to be very hard um, for the Tigrayan forces to sustain a conventional war here. That's primarily because of their supply lines. Uh, they are encircled uh, by the federal forces. It's believed that the federal forces have already cut off Tigray's main um, wartime supply routes. That's through Western Tigray to Eastern Sudan. And on the north, they face a hostile, um, a hostile entity in terms of the Eritrean government. So there is huge doubt about the ability of Tigray's forces to sustain a war. However, they have taken control of a portion of the federal military station in Tigray. They do have a strong regional security apparatus, and that is supported um, by a well-organized and quite large militia. The other element uh, relates to these electoral and constitutional disputes, um, which in turn relate to broader e issues um, in Ethiopian politics and history. That is the question of autonomy and self-determination. Um, as implied or indicated in your question, the Tigrayan people, um, it seems, and definitely the leadership, they consider the election not to have been unconstitutional, but to be an act of legitimate self-determination. Therefore, there appears to be widespread sentiment in Tigray and not just amongst the TPLF leadership 
that this federal intervention is unjustified. This means that in addition to those relatively strong um, forces that Tigray possesses, there is also um, a cause that perhaps people are willing to struggle for, and there is also a long history of struggle against uh, the central government uh, for Tigray and autonomy. There's also a long history of that in Tigray. So they have decent firepower. They don't necessarily have the ability to sustain that firepower, but there is a certain willingness to fight and popular support um, for the cause um, of the Tigrayan leadership. That is why, despite the advantages the federal government has, this might end up being a protracted and very damaging conflict. Right. One of the most horrific stories to come out of this conflict so far is the massacre in Maikadra, a town in western Tigray. Uh, do we know now who the perpetrators were and who the victims were? We do not know for sure who the perpetrators were or who the victims were. Um, the initial report from Amnesty, um, which catalyzed a lot of media coverage, that said that the Amhara regional government reported that the victims were mostly of the Amhara ethnicity. And it said that one uh, witness on the scene said that identity cards showed they were Amhara. A report by Reuters speaking to Tigrayan refugees said that actually Tigrayans were attacked in that locality. Um, at this stage, we cannot be authoritative about who committed that attack. Uh, we cannot be authoritative about who all the, what, what the identity of all of the victims are. All we know is that her, a horrific attack using blades was carried out on civilians in this area um, of Western Tigray. Um, both sides are claiming the others have used it. And I think an important point to note is that the initial perception was created, both in the international media and also in Ethiopia, that this was an attack ordered by the TPLF or committed by TPLF allied forces that therefore mobilized Amhara sentiment against the TPLF. And also it's, it, it mobilized some Amhara elements to try and reclaim territory in West Tigray, they say the TPLF annexed, and it also stiffened the federal government resolve, resolve uh, to pursue a military solution against the TPLF and made any chance of a negotiated settlement even less likely. William, stay with us. Thank you for that. Now, the TPLF governed Ethiopia for about a quarter of a century, roughly until Abiy took power. They led a coalition of the country's four main ethnic groups. It was called the EPRDF, the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, comprising the Oromo, the Amhara, the Southern Nations, and Tigrayans. What's interesting is that Tigrayans make up only 6% of the population. The Oromo and Amhara are much bigger, with around 35% and 27%, respectively. Let's bring in our second guest now. Uh, Ewol, why did, historically, the Tigray have this leadership position, despite having uh, quite a small percentage of the population? Yeah, I think the simple answer for that is that Tigrayans were one of the most well-organized and heavily armed insurgent movements that overthrew the Derg government. Um, they were, uh, I think, one of the most uh, nearly professional um, fighting forces next to the uh, Eritrean People's Liberation Front. At the time, towards the 1980s, it was very clear that the intention of the uh, Eritrean side was to secede from Ethiopia and form an independent Eritrean state, whereas TPLF wanted uh, to control Ethiopia. So when the fall of the Derg regime became imminent towards the late 1980s, TPLF moved to create an umbrella organization called the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, and it created um, political organizations for uh, three of the other most important political constituencies in Ethiopia, namely the Oromo, the Amhara, and the Southern Nations, Nationalities, and the People. So it's basically that coalition that ruled Ethiopia from 1991 until uh, December 2019, when the current prime minister replaced EPRDF with a new political party. Now, that's my, now, my, my question, is why did he do that? He, he was effectively, you know, elected to head it, and then he dismantled it and set up his own party, the Prosperity Party, and 
thereby relegating the Tigray compared to the power they, they had enjoyed. Why did he do that? Yeah, so, you know, as William was uh, saying earlier, uh, the prime minister came on the back of a popular movement, particularly by the Oromos, uh, that ran uh, from 2015 until 2018. And when he was selected by EPRDF at the time, he had a very specific mandate, which is to lead the country through a process of transition while at the same time uh, building national consensus, promoting reconciliation, and widening the political space. Um, Abiy started off on a very positive note. I think he widened the political space. He did a very good job in terms of uh, opening up the political process. But at the same time, he was working on consolidating his own personal power. And that process of consolidating personal power was very much uh, revolved around um, sidelining TPLF and also um, of somewhat blaming TPLF for everything that happened uh, in the country. William, there are concerns. Uh, I've heard them expressed over in the United States uh, that Ethiopia <clears throat> could collapse potentially. And there's a, another set of concerns that the entire region, the Horn of Africa, could be drawn in. It is already, partially, if you count, if you were to count Eritrea. Um, can you talk about those two concerns, please? The federal government is talking about achieving a quick military victory. Um, over the TPLF here. Um, if that succeeds, um, then there perhaps is no reason to think that the conflict will spread in a significant way and escalate to the region. The danger is that those federal ambitions um, are not realized, um, that the federal government becomes preoccupied and somewhat bogged down um, in a protracted conflict in Tigray. That will materially weaken it, and that will also embolden other opponents of the federal government notably um, from the Oromo nationalist bloc. Um, fairly recently, the federal government moved significant moves against the opposition in Oromia um, by arresting a huge number, um, a large number of the Oromo nationalist leaders. Um, but like I say, if, they, if the federal government gets bogged right. down in this conflict, it will embolden opponents and it could lead to increasing instability um, throughout Ethiopia. Obviously, if we do have that sort of increasing stability throughout Ethiopia, let's say the fragmentation in the armed forces deepens, or there is considerable dissent from the ruling party itself about the course of the conflict in Tigray, combined with increased opposition. If we have that sort of overall threat to Ethiopia's stability, that is where it could have an impact on the broader region, not just in terms of refugee flows from Ethiopia, but it will reduce Ethiopia's ability to act as a regional peacekeeper and all of the peripheral areas of Ethiopia, whether that's bordering Somalia or South Sudan or Sudan or Kenya, they could also become um, theatres of instability and that could have um, a knock-on effect on those neighbouring countries. Right. Hey, well, just a final question for you. Um, you know, your, your home country is led by a man who was awarded the, the highest prize, the, the Nobel Peace Prize, just last year. Uh, looking at what's happening now in the country, do you think it was premature? Absolutely. I think at this point, um, you know, when you have a prime minister who is a Nobel Peace Laureate and is not willing to rule out the possibility of an armed confrontation to solve an ideological and a political problem, then of course this is a premature decision. But, you know, everybody acted on the base of what was available to them uh, at the time. Uh, but I think the risk now is that if the international community couldn't pressure the prime minister to de-escalate the situation. This would indeed lead to the largest state collapse in the Horn of Africa, but also I think could destabilize uh, the Horn of Africa region uh, for years uh, to come. Awal Allo and uh, William Davison, thank you both so much for your contributions to the Nexus today. Really appreciate it. Let's now turn to the growing humanitarian crisis and the UN estimates that as many as 27,000 people have already crossed into neighboring Sudan. Bazan Bazan and Motia Saka, you know, and I'm a citizen of the left and no Elena. You're watching what I'm going to tell me about the Lacho. Who lashed in the Saka and I live here, Bess and Elen, Yellow Bess and Atenum, Tacha Grand Casa, or Goreveta Vedranella Bessno. Mangus the Grayon and Mangus Alam Canavla, Yena. 
Africa. Well, let's speak to Dana Hughes now. She's from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, Dana, thank you for joining us. You're in Nairobi, Kenya, and you're keeping an eye on the situation in Ethiopia and in Sudan. Um, how do you keep yourself informed? Oh. We have excellent people on the ground who are feeding us information and who are letting us know what's going on. Um, and it's really important that there's a regional outlook to this as well. Yeah, and how do you help them, Dana? Well, what we do um, is we provide support, but really, in, in especially in Sudan, we're looking at, you know, really supporting the Sudanese government. After all, it's the Sudanese government and the Sudanese people who are the ones that are taking in the some um, 28,000, as of today, refugees. Right. And the Sudanese government, were they asked by uh, Prime Minister Abiy of Ethiopia to shut the border? And have they done so? I'm not aware that that's the case. Uh, what we are aware of is that, as of now, refugees are continuing to flee to safety. And um, we are continuing to work with the Sudanese government to register these refugees, to try to provide them ur you know, urgent assistance. I mean, you have to remember that this is really an unfolding um, large-scale humanitarian crisis that's happened over the last two weeks. Refugees, they're arriving yeah. tired. They're arriving scared. They're arriving with little more than the clothes on their backs. So we're very focused on really helping those who've arrived to get these, the basic assistance they need to survive. The, the Sudanese government has had a lot of trouble of its own recently, a lot of turmoil, and it's not exactly rich. How is it coping? Well, as of now, the Sudanese government has continued to work very closely with us. Uh, their Ministry of Health and the Sudanese uh, Red Crescent have even set up two um, health clinics that are screening refugees and giving them uh, nutritional things. They've worked with us to identify a site some 80 kilometers from the border uh, to, to set up a new camp. You have to remember that this area of Sudan hasn't seen refugees of any significant amount in, in more than 20 years. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say, Matthew, that, you know, in this region, it is not unusual for countries that have troubles, for countries that have their own issues, that have little resources, yeah. to open up their borders and continue to let refugees in and welcome them. Are the people the refugees coming from Ethiopia getting enough help, or are you going to put out a wider call for assistance? We're absolutely putting out a call for, for more donor support, individual support. As I said, you know, this, this area prior to two weeks ago had a registration center that was supposed to be for about 300 refugees. And now it's registering between 12 and 15,000 refugees with, you know, 28,000 um, in total, that need this assistance with more coming literally every single day. So starting in a lot of ways from scratch, and there needs to be international support and solidarity. And Dana, they are going through an awful lot, aren't they? I mean, we're seeing pictures of people floating down the river, walking for miles and miles. Can you please tell us what that journey is like? What are they reporting to you? It's really, truly heartbreaking. Uh, there is a woman that we spoke to, um, her name was Aziz, I believe, and she was telling a story about how they heard gunshots, they just had to run. She hasn't seen her husband in five days, and she was crying. She doesn't know whether he made it out. Um, two weeks ago, her life was normal. She said they were working, they had a home, they were living like you and I live. And now her family has more or less been, been torn apart. I mean, when I say that people have come with little more than the clothes on their back and that more than 50%, at least 50% of the people that are fleeing are children, it's mostly women and children, it's not a numbers game. We're talking about individual families who have been split up, mm. who are traumatized, and who are not sure what the future holds for them. Dana, just a final question. We are hearing from Sudan itself that it has closed the border in certain areas. Is that likely to be an impediment to refugees? We're always advocating in any refugee situation that governments keep their borders open to allow those who are forced to flee through no fault of their own to seek asylum. Um, what we know so far is that Sudan has been more than generous 
and continues this generosity. We have high level officials who are now working with the government to identify this area. We have heard stories of Sudanese people in the area coming out to help the refugees who are coming over. So, you know, we are very much appreciate the generosity of the Sudan government and particularly the generosity of the Sudanese people. Dana Hughes, thank you so much for that update from Nairobi in Kenya. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching uh, this particular edition of Nexus. If you want to see this or any of our previous episodes, you can go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Until next week then, goodbye.